So thank you very much. I'm delighted to, to, to be here today and to do this presentation on interventional research on research to improve the peer review process. Just a few points related to, to, to my background and how I'm going to, to uh, the background of this talk also. So I'm a clinical epidemiologist. So I'm a rheumatologist at the beginning who moved to uh, uh, clinical research. So trying to evaluate treatment in uh, clinical trials and randomized control trials. And so, and the topic of my team, of my research team, which is an INSEM research team, is uh, dedicated to the evaluation of treatment in clinical research. So all the focus of my presentation will be more on peer review uh, dedicated to clinical research and the example I will, I will provide are related to clinical research. So just for a start, I think we all agree that the peer review process is central uh, to the scientific community. It's a cornerstone to the dissemination of stressful scientific results. And in a way, we could uh, say that the peer review process has two major goals. First, it's a gatekeeper to, uh, of the scientific publications, trying to identify which publications shouldn't be in the uh, public domain because in a way they're not good enough. And so trying to screen uh, a minimum le level of uh, publication. And the other goal is, of course, to improve the quality of manuscripts. And, uh, uh, what is, and the focus of my talk will be mainly uh, on uh, the role of a uh, peer review process uh, to improve the quality of the manuscripts that are finally published. What is also really important in the peer review system is actually it is mainly relying on the work performed voluntarily by academic researcher and the fact that academic researcher don't have a specific time dedicated to this work. It's in addition to all the other work they are uh, doing. So the first questions I would like to ask is, uh, is the peer review process achieving its goal? And what evidence do we have on the impact of the peer review process? So to try to answer this question, we first try to do a systematic review with meta-analysis. So the goal was to identify all the studies, uh, particularly of randomized controlled trials, because they are of higher level of evidence. We can have more confidence in the results uh, that were evaluated it did, uh, any intervention that could improve the peer review process. Uh, we did this systematic review. It was published in 2016, so quite a while ago. Uh, and at that time, we identified only 22 reports of randomized controlled trials. The intervention of CEST were whether it was useful to blind uh, peer, review, uh, peer reviewer, to use open peer review uh, training, the use of checklists, or uh, adding an expert. Uh, but what was striking was the small number of randomized controlled trials. So everything rely on this system, but it's not really evaluated. That most of these trials were performed in a single journals and very often had metodological issues uh, and low metodological quality. And we can see it here uh, with a high uh, risk of bias of several uh, trials. So there were some other works trying which try to uh, evaluate the impact of the peer review process. And uh, that was done by with Sally Hopwell and published in the BMG in 2014. Uh, at that time, we started having some uh, open access uh, journals uh, gave access to the manuscript, the first manuscript submitted, the peer review reports. And of course, we had access to the final report. And so it was quite easy for us just to compare what was in the submitted manuscript and what was in the final manuscript and to see in a way uh, what was the impact of the peer review process on the content of the manuscript. So we had a sample of 93 uh, published uh, randomized controlled trials. And the first results were that the changes were quite limited. We had a median of 11% of words that were deleted and 20% of the words that were, that were added in the manuscript. So that's quite limited. We were also very interested in some specific items. So in the field of clinical research, uh, 
there are some essential information that we that should be reported in a published report because they provide the necessary information on the methods and on the results. And so to make sure that these essential information are reported, we develop some what we call reporting guidelines, such as a consort statement, which are checklists of items indicated what are the essential information that should systematically be reported in the published report. And this allows improving the transparency of published reports. And so we wanted to see what was the impact of the peer review on the transparency of the manuscript and on whether these essential information were actually reported. So you can see the results here. You have in blue uh, the reporting of the submitted manuscript and in purple the reporting in the published manuscript. And these items are related to how the randomization was conducted, whether people were blinded to the treatment re received, whether the primary outcome was clearly identified and clearly reported, whether we had the results for the primary outcome, and whether harm was adequately reported. Well, as you can see here, the peer reviewer, so first the reporting is low, sorry. First, the reporting is low because these essential information are reported in less than 50% of the manuscript for most items. And the peer review process didn't uh, have a much impact on the quality of reporting. And particularly for the results section, the peer review process did not at all improve the quality of reporting of uh, the result for the primary outcomes and for harms. We also uh, were interested to compare a published report uh, that went through the peer review to um, results that were posted in clinical trial registry. So in the field of clinical trials, the uh, investigator have the duty to publish their results, but also to post the results on clinical trial registry. And clinical trial registry, it, they don't do any peer review. They just have a very specific template that all investigators have to fulfill to report their results. And so we tried to compare the completeness of reporting on the registry, which was not peer reviewed, but used a specific template, to the published article, which was peer reviewed. And interestingly, we had information that were much more complete on the trial registry for key outcomes. For example, the efficacy results were reported in 79% compared to 69% in the published manuscript. Serious adverse events were reported for all trial in the clinical trial registry, but only 63% in the published uh, article. So this is really, we took a sample of trials that are both the results in the published manuscript and in the trial registry. And the peer review articles was less good than uh, the uh, registry, which no, was not peer reviewed. Another action that we would expect from peer reviewer, another issue that we have in published article is what we call selective reporting of outcome, which is a very big issue in the field of clinical research. In the field of clinical research, we have to pre-specify some outcome and we have usually one primary outcomes and several secondary outcome. They are pre-specified in the protocol. And all the trials is planned to show indifference on these outcomes. And the expected analysis in the main results should be the analysis based on these pre-specified outcomes. However, a lot of uh, work has shown that there was a switch in the outcome meaning that investigators of clinical trials, when the primary outcome, which should be used to, do, to make the conclusion of the trials, was not statistically significant, they tend to not report it and report another outcome as their primary outcome. So there's a selective reporting out outcomes in favor of statistically significant results. And the beauty for clinical trials is that at the peer review level, 
it's an issue that is really easy to detect. You just have to look at the manuscript, search in the registry, and compare the outcome in the manuscript to the outcome in the registry. And you know that if you do that, you will have a huge impact on the quality of the manuscript that will be published. However, in a survey of more than 600 authors and reviewers who had reviewed at least one article reporting a clinical trial in the past two years, only one third actually examined the information registered on a trial registry. So the essential task that we could expect from peer reviewer, which are to, uh, evaluate, to make sure that the manuscript provide all the essential information and is transparent and make sure that there's no selective reporting of outcome is not actually not performed by the peer review process. The last issue that we were interested in is what we call SPIN. So we define SPIN as a way of reporting to convince the reader that the beneficial aspect of the experimental treatment is higher than shown by the results. So for example, you have a randomized controlled trial, you uh, had defined your primary outcome and your primary outcomes show no statistically significant difference between the treated group compared to the group treated by a placebo. And so your conclusion should be, well, we don't have any evidence that the new treatment is beneficial, but some authors spin their results. And so they're either going to focus on another outcome that is statistically significant or do a, a lot of subgroup analysis to convince that the treatment work or to use linguistic spins such as uh, uh, the treatment almost achieve statistically uh, significant difference. And spin, we showed that spin is quite prevalent in published manuscript because when we did a uh, systematic assessment of randomized control trial with non-statistically significant results, we found spin in the abstract conclusion in about half of the manuscript. And we also showed that the presence of spin in the abstract could influence readers' interpretation. So are peer reviewer detecting spin and are they uh, avoiding spin in the published manuscript? So we assessed a sample of studies. These were non-randomized study evaluating a treatment. Again, we use open access journal because they gave access to the submitted manuscript, to the peer review report. And of course we had access to the published report. And we compared the submitted report to the published report and analyzed the comment of the peer reviewer. We identified that we found that uh, in more than half of the manuscript, peer reviewer actually identified at least one example of spin. In 68%, they were able to uh, delete this uh, completely delete the spin. In 60%, they partially deleted the spin. And in 17%, they could not remove the spin from the final manuscript. But on the other hand, uh, in 50% of the manuscript on the article, peer reviewer actually requested adding some spin. And when we looked at the conclusion, you can see here the conclusion before the peer review and the conclusion after the peer review. So when it's red, it means that we have a high level of spin. In yellow, it's a moderate level of spin, green low level and uh, blue uh, no spin. Well, we can see that overall, there is not much difference before and after the peer review. Of course, we have some high level of spin manuscript that after the peer review process become low level of spin. But we also have a manuscript that was submitted with no spin in the conclusion that after the peer review process become high level of spin. And overall, in 76% of the manuscript, peer reviewer were unable to identify spin in the abstract conclusion. Another question, so overall, these results are quite disappointed because for key elements where we would like peer reviewer to be active, which are improving transparency, avoiding selective reporting of outcome and avoiding spin, 
our results show that peer reviewer had, uh, um, well, the peer review process at least, had not a huge impact. Now, is the peer review process accurate? Well, there are some studies that uh, uh, highlighted some issues. This is a, a study that I think is really interesting. It was done by editors. I think it was in the field of orthopedics. And what they did was to create a, a false manuscript. Uh, they did write two uh, version of a well-designed randomized control trial. So that did not exist. So it was fake uh, uh, trial, but they write two manuscripts. Uh, both manuscripts had exactly the same methods, except that one manuscript had statistically significant outcome and the other manuscript had non-statistically significant outcome. They uh, identified more than 200 peer reviewers at two journals, and they were randomized to assess either the manuscript that had positive results or the manuscript that had negative results. They managed to, to do this design by, in advance, uh, informing all, the peer, all their community of peer reviewers that they might at one point do a study. And if peer reviewer, for which the peer reviewer won't be informed, and if peer reviewer didn't want to participate in this study, they could opt out. And so they were able to randomize more than 200 uh, peer reviewers. And the results are quite interesting because overall peer reviewers were more likely to recommend the positive version of the manuscript for publication. And it was uh, 97% versus 80%. So it's quite important difference. But what is even more uh, alarming is that with that they detected more error in the negative version of the manuscript and they awarded a higher score for the methods in the positive version of the manuscript, while the methods between the two manuscripts were exactly the same. So this highlights that really there is some important cognitive bias related to the results uh, during the peer review process. And there were some questioning on whether we should ask reviewer to evaluate the manuscript without looking at the results, start evaluating the manuscript by looking only at the methods or trying to have them blinded of which treatment, which, uh, which one is the treatment group. But there are some questions related to this issue. Another study that was published uh, in 2016 uh, in, in the JAMA, uh, they used similar design. They had a fabricated manuscript um, with either the name of the authors that were prestigious authors that everybody knew with prestigious institution were either visible or masked. And they found that reviewers were more likely to recommend acceptance when the prestigious authors' names and institution were visible than when they were redacted. So 87 versus 68%. And they also gave higher rating to the methods. So the questions is really, what could we do? What, uh, what can be done? And that's where you know, our approach as uh, doing research on research, where we question our research practice and trying to find intervention and do interventional uh, research on research. The idea is really to find simple low cost intervention because we of course don't have much money in this field and nobody wants to invest in this field. So our first approach was to step back and to say, well, what is actually all the tasks that we expect from peer reviewer? And uh, are these tasks explicitly stated? Uh, and are these tasks uh, adequately understood by the editors and the peer reviewer? So to answer this question, we first did a large uh, systematic review to try to identify all the tasks that are expected from peer reviewer. We also interviewed some uh, editors, interviewed some uh, peer reviewer, looked at the recommendations to editors from uh, uh, peer reviewer, and overall we identified 200 tasks. And these tasks involve, first it's a huge 
amount of task. Uh, and uh, uh, peer reviewer has a small amount of time to dedicate to the peer review process. And these tasks involve very different level of expertise. So some involve a very high level of uh, statistical or methodological expertise. Some involve some content expertise. People need to know uh, the field, if it's uh, rheumatology, if it's uh, uh, cardiology. Uh, and some don't require any expertise. Uh, for example, checking some adherence to guidelines, uh, checking consistency with registry or some formatting would not need any uh, specific uh, expertise and might need a small uh, training. Then we try to classify this task in a specific category and compare the expectations of reviewer and researcher to the expectation of the journals. And so we ask a sample of uh, more than 200 uh, uh, experts so who were doing uh, review and who we were working in the field of clinical uh, trials to uh, sort to classify the different tasks uh, as the most important to the least important. So they had to do it on a scale. And here you have the percentage of participants rating the item in the first, first tertile of the scale. And so you, we can see here the different items. For example, the first item is to evaluate the risk of bias of the trial. The second item is to determine if the conclusion is consistent with the results, which is dedicated to spin. Third item is ade uh, adequacy of statistical analysis. And on the other hand, we looked at what were the tasks requesting by the journals. So we just looked at the recommendations made by the journals. We also contacted editors to ask them about the recommendation they sent to a, a peer reviewer. And we read all this recommendation and determined how often they clearly stated that one of the tasks expected from peer reviewer was to evaluate the risk of bias, where it was in less in in five percent of the journals among the one hundred and seventy one journals that we evaluated. Other tasks that were deemed much less important by a peer reviewer, such as evaluating the adequacy of the language, was very often requested by the journal. Similarly, uh, the task which was to, uh, um, I can't find it anymore, but to um, give an advice uh, on the, to, to give a recommendation for publication, which is here, sorry, was rated in the first tertile by only 21% of the experts, but was requested in almost all manuscripts, in 76% of the journals. So there is sort of a discrepancy between the expectation and request of journals, and what uh, reviewers find important. And there is also too many tasks uh, uh, that are expected from peer reviewer, and by definition, they won't be able to uh, uh, perform all these tasks. So then we thought that perhaps some of the tasks that were particularly important, for example, detecting selective reporting of outcome and uh, uh, improving the transparency of the manuscript, which were actually not well done by the usual peer review process. Perhaps we should have a two-stage uh, peer review system where we would ask early career researcher that we would specifically train to do this very specific task, and they could be more performance than the usual peer review process to detect uh, uh, lack of uh, transparency and uh, selective reporting of outcome. So that was our hypothesis. So we first developed a tool uh, where uh, early career researcher could upload the manuscript they have to evaluate, and they just have to answer very specific questions related to whether some specific items are adequately reported or checking whether the outcome reported were in line with the outcome planned in the articles. And when they finish their assessment, there is an automatically generated peer review report requesting the authors to report this information. We also developed a training module with example uh, ext so extract from manuscript, 
where we asked early career researchers to answer the questions and they would pro uh, provide the feedback whether the answer is correct or why and whether the answer is incorrect and why. And then we thought we needed to evaluate whether it works, whether early career researchers are actually able to do these two very important tasks uh, for uh, the quality of a manuscript. So our objective here was to compare the performance of early career researcher using our tool, which we called COPPEER, compared to the usual peer review process in identifying two elements, incomplete reporting, so lack of transparency, and selective reporting of outcomes, so whether the author switched the outcome between the registry and the published report. For this purpose, we did a cross-sectional study. Uh, so we identified uh, manuscripts that were um, published in open access journal, for which we had the first submitted manuscript, the peer review reports, and of course, the final manuscript. And this initial submitted report, we had a sample of 120, we send them to early career researcher. They had to do um, an, an assessment of the manuscript using the tool. We also retrieve all the peer reviewer report to the peer review report that were submitted to the journal and that were available on the journal website. And we assessed this peer review report to check in their comments, did the peer reviewer identified selective reporting of outcome, and did the reviewer identify incomplete reporting? And of course, we needed a gold standard. And so we decided for our gold standard to um, ask two systematic reviewers. Uh, systematic reviewers are going to use the report to do a systematic review and meta-analysis. So they need the information to be adequately reported to be evaluate, able, for example, to, uh, to be able to evaluate uh, the quality of the study and to be able to use the results of the study in a meta-analysis. And so we ask two systematic reviewers to evaluate the completeness of reporting and the switch uh, of outcomes, the selective reporting of outcomes, which is usual part of the work of systematic reviewers. And these are our results. So our primary outcome was a mean number of domain accurately classified uh, per manuscript by early career researcher versus the usual peer review process. And overall, early career researcher did better than the usual peer review process. They had a better sensitivity in detecting incomplete reporting, 86% versus 20% in detecting switch in primary outcome, 61% versus 11%. But they had, of course, a lower specificity uh, in detecting incomplete reporting, 71% versus 78%. And in switch of the prim primary outcome, 78, 7% versus 98%. And of course, you can see here, at the top, it's early career researcher. So that's true positive, false negative, true negative, and false positive. They were more likely to have true positive compared to the usual peer review process, but they also had more false positive, which is explained by the lower specificity. And so we felt that such approach uh, could be particularly useful to have sort of a two-step peer review process uh, which would involve early caring researcher detecting a simple task for which they would be trained with a specific uh, training tool, and which would allow them to start entering and becoming and learning on how to become uh, a peer reviewer. And that would allow sending to more expert peer reviewer a manuscript that is completely reported and for which we wouldn't have any selective reporting of outcome. And where the uh, expert peer reviewer could really uh, adequately evaluate the report. There are some other studies that were done 
uh, to try to improve the peer review process uh, since uh, our systematic review. So just to give you some examples, this is a study that aims to improve, again, the transparency of published reports. And so the idea was to give uh, to peer reviewers uh, a checklist of the item that they should uh, check uh, systematically when they do their peer review. And it was a randomized controlled trials. And unfortunately, we found that this intervention had no impact on the completeness of reporting of the published report. In another study, we tried to see whether we could reduce spin at uh, the level of the editorial process. Here, the idea was not to be at the level of peer reviewer, but to be at the level of the editor. And so the idea here was to have a small tool uh, where we would remind to the authors what essential item they have to check to avoid spin in the abstract. OK, so it was a, uh, 10, 10 items they had to check to make, uh, to make sure that their abstract fulfilled these 10 recommendations and did not have spin. And here it was an edit editorial intervention, meaning that the manuscript was sent to peer reviewer. He got the feedback from peer reviewer. And the decision was to ask for a revision manuscript. And so with the request to revise the manuscript, the editor sent a request to revise the abstract and to check that there was no spin of the, in the abstract. And in this study, it was also a randomized controlled trial. So manuscripts were randomized to receive the email from the editors uh, to revise the abstract or to receive nothing except the usual peer review process. And unfortunately, uh, this study showed no impact at all of this intervention. I would like to, to finish this presentation with uh, uh, some comments on preprint, because preprint for us is sort of quite new in the field of clinical research. Uh, in the field of clinical research, we're, we're not used to preprint. You know, nobody put anything on preprint before COVID. And then COVID arrived, and COVID, uh, by definition, we needed to have information related to the results of the clinical trials that were conducting and evaluating treatment very quickly. And we've, there was a, a huge number of uh, communications that went through preprint. OK. This was really important, and just to highlight that, how preprint were important during that time, is just the example of the recovery trial. So the recovery trial is a very big trial that was conducted by um, the Oxford team to, to assess several treatments for COVID-19. So it was mainly treatment for severe patients, so patients who were hospitalized. And it was, uh, they, they did what we call platform trials. So they did a series of randomized controlled trials with a huge number of patients. It was the biggest trials done uh, in the world. And when recovery evaluated dexamethasone, which is a treatment that demonstrated its beneficial effect on COVID-19, if the delay between the time they post the results on preprint and the time the article was published in a peer-reviewed journal was one month, which is very, very, very short compared to the usual time for the publication of a randomized control trial, which can take you know, nine months, one year. And in this one month, there were 700,000 new COVID cases with a lot of death. So the fact that they communicate the results through preprint possibly avoided a lot of death. On the other hand, we also had lots of preprint that were secondarily that were very bad, and that disseminated very bad research. Okay, and that were secondarily retracted. At that time, we were in charge of doing a very very large um, uh, systematic review with a meta analysis, and so we identified all the study, and we were doing several meta analyses to combine the results for each different types of treatment and treatment comparison. 
And so the question for us, because that was really new in our field, is whether we should include preprint in our meta-analysis or whether we should include only peer-reviewed journals. And some people decided to include only peer-reviewed journals. Our approach was to include preprint and peer-reviewed journals. We even had a process to identify update of preprint and update our, our results when the preprint were updated. Um, but those who decided not to include uh, preprint, this is the amount of uh, study that uh, they were they would include either never or with a delay. So the questions we had was, well, could we trust the result of preprint? So we identify all the randomized control trials that were first published as preprint and then published in the peer review journal. And we checked for the outcome that, were, uh, um, that we were interested in, which were mortality, clinical improvement, uh, the severity of the disease, adverse event, and serious adverse event, whether there was a change in the estimation of the effect of the treatment. And for the 100 study, we identify some discrepancy in 29 studies. But most of the time, it was the addition of an outcome that was not reported in the preprint and was reported in the published report. So meaning that the preprint was probably incomplete in terms of outcome. Sometimes they remove some outcome in the published report, and we had to, to, to check why. But we only had nine studies where there is a change in the effect estimates, but the change was very minor. So it's going to be a small change in the 95 confidence interval, uh, a really small change in, in the effect that would not impact our interpretation of the results. Of course, this is partial because here we don't have the preprint that would never be published. So we did another study, which is called meta-epidemiologic study, to see whether if we include preprint at one time, it would yield in the, in the meta-analysis, it would yield another estimation of the treatment effect. And we did not find a huge difference, but we didn't have much power. So, so in a way, uh, again, this question, the role of the peer review process, because in a way it delay access to the treat, to the results of the trials, but did not provide uh, much changes in terms of uh, transparency and in terms of results. Perhaps just to finish two points, um, I think um, this is some illustration of uh, issue that we have uh, that are unsatisfactory in the way the peer review process is implemented in the field of clinical research. Uh, the need to develop specific intervention and the need to evaluate this intervention. And of course, there is some question of which intervention we should design and we need to brainstorm about which type of intervention could actually improve the peer review process. But we also need to work on what study design will help us evaluate uh, these different interventions. Should we randomize manuscript? Should we randomize peer reviewer? Should we do time series analyses? Uh, there was some cluster randomized control trials, step, step wage randomized control trial. So we need to think of what type of study design. And there are also some issue of what should be the outcome. What will be the outcome are the different intervention that we are evaluated. And so we've been working on various, on identifying the different scales that are being used to assess the uh, uh, success of the peer review process. But uh, most of these tools evaluate different concepts. They don't define the concept of quality. And there's a lot of work that needs, methodological work that needs to be done here. And finally, of course, uh, currently we see a huge increase in uh, AI tool. And uh, I think AI tool could help uh, for some ta task of the peer review process, but we definitely need to work on uh, how we develop this tool, uh, for what purpose, and how we evaluate this tool. 
and uh, thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer the question. And I'd just like to finish with this slide and to highlight Drummond Rainey, who, is, uh, uh, was, who was editor uh, at the JAMA, who created the peer review Congress and who was one of the editors at the time that were schooling uh, to do more research in the field of uh, peer review and to make uh, peer review more scientific. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any question. Thanks a lot, Isabel, for this bright talk. So we have we have several questions in the chat. You can go in the chat. So I started with with the first question about the spin studies and if you know if you know other studies in spin in, in other fields, so such as biology, physics. And if there is a link between the spin and the financial conflict of interest, I, I was wondering. Okay, so so for the spin, we studied it a lot uh, in the field of uh, clinical research and found spin in randomized controlled trial, but in all type of study design. And perhaps from my own experience, before starting working on spin, um, I didn't realize that I was doing spin. And I think uh, if, if you go back to, if you really try to assess spin in a very structured way, uh, you, you realize that there are spin in almost everywhere. And I don't see, because researchers, when they do an experiment, they have some hunches, they have some belief, they have an hypothesis and they believe in their hypothesis. And they're not completely independent with the research they conducted. Um, and that's why, for example, for randomized control trials, we also try to have the principal investigator who is the one who is setting up the questions, but always methodologists who don't care about the results of the trial. They don't care if the results of the trial will be statistically significant or not statistically significant. We are here just to stop, to stop the enthusiasm of the um, uh, investigator and try to avoid uh, this uh, uh, enthusiastic. So I think in biology, I looked at some, at some abstract and definitely could find spin. Uh, and I don't see why physics uh, should not have. We tried to see whether there was a link with financial conflict of interest, and we didn't find any. Um, I, think, um, I think it's very linked to the cognitive bias. And we all have some cognitive bias. And so when we write our manuscript, uh, the cognitive bias will, will appear in the manuscript. Even if you try it, to stop all these cognitive bias through all the experiments we did, uh, there is some uh, uh, cognitive bias. So it's why it's really important to be conscious of the spin, to try to work on what are the strategies of spin that could be implemented, and to try to uh, avoid them. Many questions, uh, Isabel, so maybe shorter for your Sorry. answer. Your peer study is very interesting. Do you think that artificial intelligence tools could be the first pass instead of human risk reviewers? I think it could. I think it could. Yeah. I don't have proof, but um, my hunch is, especially we can see that, for example, we are starting using uh, AI to screen abstract uh, in systematic review. And so I think we, we did use, for example, uh, ChatGPT, and it worked quite well. I did some small tests on ChatGPT uh, for reporting. I think probably we need to work with people who are doing AI, but I don't see why they shouldn't be able to do it. There was then a question from Carol Wilde asking how much time is expected for two steps, peer review process from initial submission to publication. Uh, I think for the um, uh, early career researcher, it was half an hour to assess the manuscript in a, because it was only very specific question. And probably with time, it's probably more than 20 minutes. Then, of course, you lose the time where there would be a feedback to the author, where the author would have to improve the manuscript, and then it would be sent to the usual peer review process. But uh, sometimes, at least in the field of clinical research, we uh, editors have a, very, a lot of difficulties finding reviewers, and sometimes it takes them months to find a reviewer um, or two reviewer, uh, and that could be they could use this time to try with early career researcher to improve the manuscript. 
I think. But it was not, this approach was not implemented and endorsed by uh, editors. A question by Linda McLean, spin aside, I think a huge challenge with completeness of reporting is the word count limits imposed by many journals. I, I'm not sure about that because you have access to, you have the possibility to give access to appendix and some of the information can be in appendix. So every time people, you know, I like the work count limit. First, we demonstrate that it's absolutely possible to, to report in a limited number of words. If you avoid all the lengthy uh, discussion uh, where people just spin their results. And, um, and you always have the possibility to add the information in appendix. Fabien Chauveau is, has the impression from the life science and biomedicine field is that peer review can be performed quite differently by the same individuals depending on the reputation, let's say impact factor of the journal and he's asking if you have evidence for that. I don't have evidence for that. Um, I suspect, uh, well, for example, um, I would be more likely to say no uh, because I'm very busy to a low impact factor journals and say yes to a high impact factor journal. So I'm not sure they contact the same people and it's the same people doing the review in, in both groups. And what is mainly, I think the main difference with high impact factor journals is that they have in-house support. So for example, some journals will have their own uh, statistician who will check the manuscript. So they have more support than the other journals. Sarah Garofalo, uh, she said that it's incredibly interesting and she thank you. And uh, actually it's a question for PCI uh, asking if, she, if we are implementing, uh, thinking about implementing a new review process in the direction similar to the one you have suggested. So, Thomas, I don't know if you, I can start answering on this, saying that we have guidelines for reviewers, so to, to tell them exactly what we are expecting for their peer reviews and uh, paying attention on that. And, and we might think about reviewing these guidelines again to, to be more closely, yeah, to closely point the, the points that they clearly need to review when making a review. But I may add something that we, we have the feeling that uh, these guidelines are not really used by the peer reviewers, uh, given what we see in the reports of the reviewers. It looks like uh, the reviewers do not care a lot about the guidelines we, we provide uh, them. So maybe we have to find something else. This is the reason why we invited uh, Isabelle Boutron. Uh, and uh, we have to think more about the way to improve uh, the process of uh, the peer review, maybe with artificial intelligence or other tools we, we don't know yet. But we have to improve that for sure. I think there is also uh, you know, limiting what the expectation. So if we clearly say to the reviewer, well, we just want you to look at the stat. We don't care about the rest. Just look whether the statistics uh, and comment on the statistics. I think that could be also a, a one-way study. Uh, you know, target much more the expectations instead of having the same guidance for every reviewer. But it's, I mean, all that is difficult and, uh, but I agree, nobody reads the recommendations. It's like contract. Also, Masol uh, has two questions. Uh, the first one is, is pointing is pointing the role of peer peer or, or such like in, in this ecosystem and asking is peer review should be considered as final or should it continue after publication since um, peer reviewers cannot be completely trusted to see all issues. So PubP has been really important during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and PubP is a very, very important tool. Um, the issue with peer is again it's sort of voluntary and so people so it's always the same people trying to comment but you won't have a systematic assessment or you might have a lot of assessment of one specific study but it's not always related to the impact that this study will have on, on uh, a clinical practice and so that's where it would be nice that PubPeer is perhaps a, a little bit more structured, but it's, it is a very important tool. And I think uh, 
uh, I think it, it has a fundamental role and we need to keep it and to support it. There was a second question by François Massol uh, asking what, what about the group peer review enforced by eLife? So it's a peer reviewers do not review on their own, but together, and could it help or will it reinforce the bias? I think it could, I think it could work. A lot of people are starting endorsing it. I think in the field of life science and clinical research, it's far away to be endorsed um, by everybody. Uh, there is another question from Guillaume uh, Sescus. Uh, actually, I have exactly the same uh, question about uh, whether this various bias could be could be partly addressed by uh, registered reports. You, you didn't talk about registered reports, and it's widely used in, in experimental psychology, for example. And I was wondering about. Yeah. So register. Field. Yeah. So register in the field of clinical uh, research is a little bit different. Because for a clinical trial, you might have a de delay of five years be be between the protocol and the publication, right? And so they tried at one point to do an equivalent to a register report, but it didn't work out because your research question that might be interesting five years ago, uh, when she come back with a protocol that was up, yeah, that f follow the uh, a study that follow the protocol, the editor might not be interested anymore because he moved to some topic, other topics, and it's not a hot topic anymore. So this big delay didn't really work. But in the field of clinical research, we have the equivalent of clinical report. It's the clinical trial registry. Because people have the obligations to register their protocol in the clinical trial registry before including the first patient, we have all the information of their protocol. So we don't really need the clinical, uh, the, the, the we have a pre-registration if you want. And that's a wonderful tool uh, that just peer reviewer needs to use it. But if I may, Isabel, what about, this is a pre-registration, but what about making a peer review of this pre-registration, making a full registered report with evaluation of the registered report? Uh... So sometimes we publish the sometimes we publish the 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 protocol, but the peer review doesn't bring a lot. And in the field of clinical research, especially for example, academic clinical research, all our protocols are peer reviewed to obtain the funding, and then they are submitted to an ethics committee, and then. So adding some peer reviewer at this stage, I'm not sure. There is a provocative uh, question by François Massol. Uh, how often do people ask you your opinion about the fact that Einstein uh, was never peer reviewed and yet so important for modern physics? Um, that's the first time, actually. <laughs> Nobody never asked. Um... <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of, um, I think the current period, so I would say the current peer review system for me um, does not fulfill the expectations. And some people say it's like democracy. It's not perfect, but it's better than nothing. But preprint worked pretty well and preprint with post preprint peer review uh, where we can have we just need to sort of organize it but uh, where we would have a lot of people commenting of preprint and uh, improving preprint i think that could work quite well and it would be in, in the public domain and be used and people are anyway evaluating it before using it are you okay for Answering more questions? Sure, no problem. One, one from Valentin Lecheval asking, may Isabel reflect on the effects of granting researchers more time, for example, by hiring more researchers within secure positions, giving them a small amount of money without competitive grant applications on the quality of the peer review process? I, I think it's it would be great, but uh, but 
So I think currently the, the competition system, the system we are in with a huge competitions, with all the evaluation based on the number of, of publication and not at all on the quality of the publication, um, is not working well and is inducing uh, malpractice, is inducing uh, detrimental research practice. There are some attempts to rethink this evaluation system, and, and I fully uh, endorse the fact that we need to rethink uh, this uh, evaluation system. And there was, uh, I used to work with Doug Atman, who was working at Oxford, uh, who was saying we need less research, but better research. And I fully endorse that. We should do less research, but uh, better research, more ambitious research. And currently in the field of clinical, of clinical research, we're doing a lot of research and uh, not much is left when you clean up the research. A question from Caitlin Martin, or Martin, sorry about the spelling. Given how pervasive spin is, perhaps especially in high profile journals, do you think it is possible to be successfully published without an impressive name or institution? Or some level of spin. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I really think so. Uh, I I think probably the probability is higher uh, to be published in a high impact factor journal if you have a impressive name or institution. Um, but I think you can still be published. I'm not sure. I think the level of spin. Um, it's uh, big journals are aware of spin. Big journals in the field of uh, clinical medicine are aware of spin and they try to avoid spin. So you will have less spin in high impact factor journals in the field of medicine than at least general medical journal than in specialty journal uh, because it's more a habit and people are, are used to write with spin and they continue to write with spin. Anyway, when you write your first manuscript, what you do is you look how people wrote their manuscript beforehand and you just do the same. And so because everybody use spin, you use spin. And so I think it's more, um, it, it's not going to be specific to high impact factor journal. I don't think so. But you will have to fight uh, against peer reviewer uh, to uh, avoid spin. Come on. Gimo has a question. She's he is asking about if you think that forbidding lengthy discussions could be a tool to avoid the spins. Actually, you do think? Yeah, I agree. Avoid. I agree. I agree. And I think uh, I think we should. If I could imagine the perf the ideal paper of tomorrow, it would be a very structured paper with a lot of tables where you just have the number where anyone can get the number easily. And then you can leave sometimes in the discussions, but the discussion in a way is, is perhaps not even part of the paper. It's more where it's clear that uh, uh, authors are going to give their advice. And, uh, but we will have a clear method to know what was done and a clear research section to uh, be able to understand the results. And it's the reader can interpret the results. It doesn't need the, the author. Guillaume Sescus, again, uh, this time he's asking, do you know any evidence showing the insensitization of reviewers via money, citable, open review, uh, would increase quality of peer review? There's lots of discussion about uh, money, whether it will increase the quality, um, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not, I didn't look deeply into the evidence, I, I wouldn't be able to, to answer. And the last question is from Thomas again. Uh, don't you think that delegating the responsibility of publication to journals and editors may lead to less responsibility from the authors? So authors will submit bad articles, hoping that the articles will be improved by peer review and editorial work. So at the end of the day, peer review would be detrimental to the quality of articles. I wouldn't, yeah, I'm not sure I would, I would be in line with this, um, this view. Uh, I think uh, authors want to be published. They are dying to be published. And so they will do anything to make sure that the journal will be uh, 
uh, willing to publish the work and to avoid too much comment from the peer review. So I, I wouldn't see it this way, at least in the field of uh, clinical research. We are trying, we are going to work a lot, a lot, a lot to make sure that the manuscript will pass this terrible peer review process and be published. The last question, if you, if you wish, from Carol Wade. She's sure. asking, is there a quality control idea for peer reviewers in development? I think there's quite a lot of training. To quality control idea, you mean uh, a, a junior peer reviewer wants to, to learn more? Is that what it means? Not sure. I'm, I'm not sure what what is the questions, but but I think a peer reviewer in development, um, if it's an early career researcher, I, I think there are quite a lot of uh, of tools that are made available by um, by journals. Um, there is also some journals I think who try a sort of a mentorship, uh, but I think. Um, the best is to, to discuss with colleagues and to, uh, to try to uh, uh, use uh, specific uh, tools to, uh, to, to evaluate the report. And to, to be clear, I would say to be clear of what is the expertise that you're able to apply and what is not your expertise and just comment on your expertise. So for example, I've got some colleagues, they are statisticians and they clearly state, okay, I read the manuscript, I'm commenting on the manuscript, but I'm commenting only on this part, which is my level of expertise. And I think one of the problem is that people believe they have to comment on everything, even if they're not experts. And that's where we have some clinicians providing methodological and statistical advice that are uh, out of the scope. They don't stop asking questions. <laughs> Just... <laughs> it depends on you. <laughs> I, can, I, can, I can continue for... Uh, a bit, but uh, at one point. Uh... Okay, two more questions. If you agree, Jeremy Gavo is asking: Is is the conclusion of your talk truly that peer review process is basic, basically not useful, or rather that it should be improved by improving reviewers' training on the aspect that you studied? Some of which being somehow new, and therefore several reviewers having been first trained in the area. Whereas several of the today's good practices did, didn't exist. So I don't think the peer review process is not useful. I think it's very useful when it's well done. And honestly, I, I've been through for big journals where we had incredible peer reviewer that transformed the manuscript. So I think the, uh, the peer review process uh, could be very useful, but I think we need to completely rethink about it and completely transform it to make it actually useful. And that's currently there is a lot of effort being spent by a lot of people with a small return on investment. Tamagimo has a short question in asking in, in your study you showed you showed was the effect an effect of the ECR early career researcher or an effect of the cop peer? It was an effect of be. so it was an effect of early trained early career researcher using copier. So they had to do this training. They had to to set up a specific amount uh, results at the training session, and then use uh, copier. But um, you would probably have even better results with a trained uh, senior reviewer. But the idea was here to to try to engage in the peer review process uh, younger researchers.